Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for logging on or, or coming out this evening to listen to this talk um, on insects, gods, creeping things. And if any of these pictures on the screen at the moment make you feel a bit queasy or you're not too sure, I'm afraid it's not going to get much better as we go through the talk. So apologies if there's anyone who doesn't feel great about um, insects or, or things like that. You should have known that coming, hopefully. So, yeah, I'd just like to start. So we read Genesis 1, didn't we? And that was an account of God creating the world. And as Christadelphians, we believe that God created the world, that there wasn't a, a, a big man and evolution over millions or billions of years. That we believe in creation, um, that God created the world in seven days. And as we went through that chapter in Genesis chapter 1, it's interesting, isn't it? After each day, God said it was good. Um, so, so for verse 18, um, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. And that was after each day, God saw that it was good. And then we come to verse 31, when God had made everything, um, everything in the earth, he saw, uh, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God created the earth, he created everything on the earth, and it was very good. It did not need to be evolved over millions of years, as we read, as we know some people believe. Um, and just some statistics in terms of that. So which of these, uh, this is a, um, this is a, a survey that went out, and the question was, which of these statements come closest to your own point of view regarding the origin and development of human beings on earth and they had three options evolved over millions of years created within 10,000 years or not sure uh, so canada 61 percent believed in evolution 24 percent creation and 15 percent not sure america almost half uh, believed that it was created within 10,000 years and then where we are in Great Britain, over two thirds believe that it was evolved over millions of years. And being a teacher previously, um, evolution is taught as fact in schools now, and, and that's what children are taught. And so that's what the population believes in general, as, as people move further away from the Bible and more towards science. That is what seems to be the consensus when it comes to creation and evolution. So I'm hoping in this talk to sort of talk about what the Bible says and think about what we can see in the world around us and how it supports the idea of a creator. And then before we go into it, I just want to talk about evolution and adaptation uh, because they can easily be confused and, and people can um, mix them up. So adaptation is the process of change by which an organism or species become better suited to its environment. Whereas evolution is a change in the characteristics of a species over several generations and relies on the process of natural selection. Because again, as Christophans, we believe in creation, but we also see adaptation in animals um, around us and plants around us. But we would argue that we do not see evolution on the grand scale that some scientists believe. Um, and here's an example, I can't remember the moth, uh, the name of it, but it is in my notes. Um, so this is a moth that, depending on what um, is going on around it, depends on which ones are more predominant. Um, and so when there is lots of pollution, the trees where these moths land tend to be darker. And so the darker moths predominate because of that, because the lighter ones are easier for the prey to see them. And so they die out quickly and the darker ones are the ones that are mainly around. Whereas when there's not much pollution and the trees are paler, um, the darker moths are found by the prey and then so the lighter ones predominate. Um, so that's just an example of adaptation where because of the environmental factors, uh, this particular moth differs on, on which one survives better. And this is an example of adaptation, which in my head helped me. So we've got Coca-Cola bottles, um, and you can see how they changed over time. The design, the shape, 
has changed over time, all the way to uh, over 100 years ago. But at the end of the day, it's still a glass bottle. It hasn't changed the characteristics of it. It hasn't changed fundamentally what it is. It's still a glass bottle that holds Coke. And then in, in this example that I found, evolution would be the can, going from a glass bottle to a metal can. And, and where the characteristics have completely changed, the fundamental parts of what makes it has changed into something completely different. Whereas adaptation is that slight change over time that you do see in some animals or Coke bottles um, for that example. So what do we find out in Genesis 1? So God created everything. He created land, sea, plants, animals, and insects. And so as Christophans, we believe uh, that animals did not evolve from one single organism over billions or millions of years. So you might ask, why would we look at insects to have a look at creation and evolution? So first of all, insects are interesting I believe so, um, on, on the whole. But here is a list of the different species, how many different species there are in each animal group. So at the top we've got mammals. So there's 4,381 different types of mammals in the world. And we've got birds, reptiles, frogs, toads, and all these different <coughs> animals, insects, sea creatures, and how many different species there are for each of these groups. And I've blanked out the one, which is insects. So the highest at the moment is snails, clams, and octopus, which is 93,000 different types. So any guesses in the audience, how many different types or species of insects there are? Any guesses from the audience? One million, good guess. Good guess, any others? Oh, 10 million. 10 million. Too high. Too high, but you ruined it for me, but no, it's fine. Um, so 915,000 different types of insects. Very good guess at the back, very good. Um, so that's 10 times any of the other lists of um, types of animal groups on this list. And so I think that's a really good um, thing that we can look at. And it's 80% of the world's species are insects. And of course, there may be many thousands more that haven't been discovered yet in, in different corners of the earth. So I believe it's a great example of proving design, proving that there was a creator. Uh, so this is a chart um, that evolutionists would um, put forward to explain how all the insects that we have came from one at the start. So on the left, we've got the first insect billions of years ago, and then as time goes on, you can see how through evolution and change, and um, we've got to lots of different insects now. Um, and you can see at the bottom uh, the different time periods, uh, so Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and, and all the different time periods. So this is what scientists believe and evolutionists believe when it comes to insects, that it started as one single organism that went into an insect, and then 900,000 different types of insects came from that one insect at the start. So that means that the firefly, which is 0.5 millimeters long, came from the same insect as the giant weta. No, that's not a model. That's, that's how big it is. Um, I can't remember exactly, but you can see if there's a, a, a man's hand there and how big the giant weta is. So it means that something as round as the ladybird also came from something, came from the same thing as, as something as lanky as a, a stick insect. It means that this um, bombardier beetle that can fire hot acid came from the same insect that was the um, uh, uh, lighting bug. I can't remember exactly what it's called. Um, but that's just to show the different range of insects that are around in the world. And scientists and evolutionists would believe that they all came from one single organism that evolved over millions of years to create these such very different insects um, and we'll look more into it as, as we go through the talk. <clears throat> so th this section of the talk is, um, again, we believe there was a creator and we believe that insects were created to be able to blend in to their surroundings. And so I'm going to put some pictures up 
of, well, I'm going to put a picture up and I want you to just nod your head or raise your hand or whatever you'd like to do to tell me if you can see the insect within the picture. Um, so I'm going to put the first one up. So we've got some leaves. I don't know, can we have the lights off? Is that okay? I don't know if people want me to see a bit. I don't know. Behind me. Oh, I see. What the power? Thank you. Um, okay, there you go. So, does anyone think they might be able to see the insect in this picture? Any nods? Yeah, possibly. So, what we've got here is a leaf insect, um, and and this is the top of the insect, and this is its back, and this is coming down to its head here. Um, that's what it looks like normally when it's not among leaves. Um, it's not a very imaginative name, but it very much describes um, what it is. And of course, if it was sitting on a branch, there would be no predator who would fly past a bird um, that would be able to see that and, and think it's food. And when it's on the branch, it even sways around when it's windy to make it look like a leaf. And you can see the brown edging to the insect as well, which makes it look even more realistic as a leaf on a branch. Um, so that's one example. We're going to put another one up. So just a normal picture of a leaf. But if you look closer, the spine of the leaf has a caterpillar. Um, so again, this is the, the bottom of the caterpillar going through to, to the head of the caterpillar. And that's what it would look like when it's not on a leaf. Um, and you can see if it was sitting in the middle of the leaf, it would be perfectly camouflaged and, and no, one be able to, uh, no predators again would be able to see. Um, and it grows into a, this butterfly. Um, but again, incredible design for it to be able to hide so well in that, in that environment. This one's a bit easier. If you haven't got one yet, this one's for you. Um, so again, this is, um, so this is imaginatively named dead leaf butterfly. Um, and you can see it there among dead leaves, but again, if it was on the, the floor of a forest in autumn, you, you can imagine how hard that would be for a predator to be able to, to see that and be able to um, get it if, if it wanted it. And that's what it looks like when it's on, on a green leaf, not very well camouflaged there, but on the whole, very well designed to be able to camouflage into its surroundings. So some of you might have these flowers in your homes. I know orchids are um, quite nice, quite, quite a lot of people have them in their homes. But there's not just orchids there. There is a orchid mantis. And some of you might have heard of a praying mantis um, as an insect. Um, but you can see it's sitting on top of the petals in the top left-hand corner. And, and that's what it looks like. And it's beautiful colors, incredibly creative. Um, but again, made to camouflage once it is amongst orchid flowers. So once again, a predator flying past wouldn't be able to, to see them. Now, <laughs> this is called a giant swallowtail caterpillar. I'd like you to think in your heads what this might be disguised as. But it does look a lot like bird droppings. And I've not got a picture of bird droppings to put alongside it. You can all imagine what that might look like. But again, if, a, if there is a, a bird flying over, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to go for that because I don't like the look of that. But again, perfectly created um, that it might look like bird droppings with the colors and, and, and the way it, that it looks. So we've got two thorny branches here. Um, but one, in fact, has no thorns on it and, and one does. So the, the one on the right, the red thorns, that is a a thorny branch, but the one on the left is a, a bare branch with thorn bugs on it. So again, you can see all the different bugs that are on this particular branch. You can see the red top of, of the thorn, and that's it a bit zoomed, more, uh, zoomed in. And again, if a, if a bird's coming past and it wants to land on that particular branch, it'll probably think twice about it because of these these bugs with these thorns on their heads, um, again, perfectly created to be able to blend in and, and to put off predators. And I've got one more, um, and this is called an orange 
tip caterpillar. Um, and it looks pretty normal from, from that point of view. But I've got a video of what happens when it feels threatened. So hopefully this will work. Sorry. Um, so this is the, the back of the caterpillar. This is its back. And then this is the head over here. So it's upside down at the moment. And the cameraman um, gets it to show what it can do when it feels threatened. Now, who could tell me what that looks like? A snake. Okay, so this is, it's, it's upside down at the moment. So it's back, is there. And it's again incredible that this is its defense mechanism that it's able to. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's upside down. And of course, any predator flying by would think, okay, I'll think twice about trying to get that snake. And you can see even the white dots on top of the eyes to make it look like the sun's coming through the branches so it looks like a snake is about to uh, about to attack and again it's not like over millions of years this caterpillar tried to put eyes on one end of its body and then the other and then tried it in different places to try and look like a snake it was created this way that it might be able to defend itself when it came to um, prey coming towards it um, so again an incredible example of, of a of a um, intelligent creator. So we're going to spend some time thinking about what do we know about insects that we find in the Bible. So we're going to spend some time looking at the locust, ants, and spiders. And, and we get verses in the Bible describing what they are capable of. So you can turn with me please to Exodus chapter 10. So in the book of Exodus, we have locusts appearing, and I'm sure some of the little ones in the room would have learned about this in Sunday school. Some of the older ones would have probably learned about this in Sunday school as well. Um, so Exodus chapter 10, we have Moses and, and Pharaoh. And Moses says to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 10, verse 4, If thou refuse to let my people go, Behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped, which remaineth unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field. And they shall fill thy houses, and the house of all thy servants, and the houses of all thy Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy fathers' fathers have seen, since the day that they are upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. So we, we know that, don't we, from um, the, the plagues, the ten plagues uh, that happened in Egypt. There's another verse in Proverbs 30, which says, The locusts have no king, yet go they all forth, all of them, by bands. And I'm just going to uh, play another video about locusts and what they're capable of, and it really reinforces what we read in Exodus and what we read in, in Proverbs chapter 30. So hopefully this works. So from a BBC documentary, I think you recognize the voice. There is no other species on the planet that responds as quickly and as dramatically to the times as the desert levels. Eggs that have remained in the ground for 20 years begin to hatch. The 
the young Americans and some of the others, who are at this stage their frontiers. They find new feeding grounds by following the smell of sprouting grass. Normally, it takes four weeks for hoppers to become adults. And when the conditions are right, as now, their development switches in the past track. As the vegetation in one place begins to run out, the wind adults release feminines, scent messages, which tell others in the group that they must move on. And when groups merge, they form a swarm. It's the most energy saving way of fire. Following the flow of wind means that they're always heading toward areas of low pressure, places where wind meets rain and vegetation starts to grow. As they fly, swarms join up with other swarms to form gigantic caves several billion strong and as much as 40 miles wide. So you can see it will consume every animal thing that lies in their path. This is one of Canada's greatest spectacles. It's rarely seen in the scale and it won't last long. Once the food is gone, the steady roar of a billion beating locust wings will once again be replaced by nothing more than the sound of the desert wind. Um, so again, a, a fascinating video um, for one of the sort of BBC um, Planet Earth series, <clears throat> and, and it, David Attenborough, the, the presenter there, talks about. Um, how they eat their body weight every day and, and obviously they don't weigh that much, it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you get swarms of millions of these locusts, you can completely understand uh, the warning by Moses and also what happened when the plague of locusts did come. They completely decimated um, areas and, and some swarms can be miles wide and, and um, can eat so much vegetation and Proverbs 30, it said that locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. Um, and again, the presenter there talked about how when there was low pressure, they moved on um, and they released pheromones so that everybody knew, okay, it's time to move on. There's no vegetation here. We're going to go in this direction because there's low pressure over here and there's going to be rain and there's going to be vegetation coming. And so um, the, the writer of the Proverbs, uh, couldn't understand it at that point, but scientists can work it out now. This is how they know how to move on. There is no leader, there is no king leading them. They all work together and, and there's different ways that they do that to be able to go to the next place all together in one swarm. And, and we see that in Exodus and in Proverbs 30 as well. So we'll move on to the ant. Uh, so if you could turn with me please to Proverbs chapter 6. So Proverbs chapter 6, let me read verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer 
and gather her food in the harvest. And so here there is an exhortation to, to lazy people, the sluggards, to look at the ant and, and consider how they work together. They don't have a guide, they don't have a ruler or an overseer, but they're able to provide for millions uh, within a colony. And Proverbs 30, verse 24 to 25 says, There be four things that are little upon the earth, but they're exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. So again, it's the same idea as Proverbs chapter 6, that they're able to provide for each other, even though they are so small. Um, and I don't have a video for this one, um, but there we've got a, a photo of ants working together to get food. And there's many videos that you're able to find online of ants working together to get food um, and, and again, working as a team. Um, and and I remember we, we were on holiday a couple of years ago now in Greece and we watched some ants get, bring, bringing food um, on this path and taking it up into a hole and it dropped down and they, they tried to do it again. And it's fascinating to see, but again, science, scientists have really looked into this and, and seen how they work as a team um, and the objects are hard, uh, objects are heavier, they're able to bring more ants in to try and help with different objects to bring food. Um, but it completely reinforces what we read in the Bible of what they're able to do, that uh, they're able to work together to, to make sure everyone has enough food in the colony. And the, the last one we'll look at is, is spiders. So if you could turn with me please to Isaiah 59. Because um, we, we don't get a lot about, uh, many descriptions about all these insects and, and what they do, but what we do get is interesting about what it picks up about these different insects. So a spider in Isaiah 59, um, verse 4 and, and then 5. So none calls for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web. It eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. And so these are people who, who weave the spider's webs. And so the Bible talks about their web. And again, that's something uh, really interesting when it comes to a particular spider. This is, I, I believe this is called the Darwin bark spider. And you can see the, the length of that web there that's gone from the completely one side of the river to the other side of the river. And I've got another video about the strength of this web and, and how it is able to create it all um, coming up. So I'll just play that one. Like a real life spider woman, she sprays strands of silk in one long continuous flow. The threads fan out like a sail and drift on air currents blowing across the water. Every few seconds, she clips the strands together to stop them spreading too widely. The breeze will do the rest. Blowing the threads into a single line and a 25 metre bridge. Now she must reinforce her bridge because her web will hang from it. But there's something bouncing the line at the other end. Another Darwin spider is trying to take advantage of her hard work. She must deal with the intruder head on. The cut line is an inconvenience, but no more than that. With hooks on the tips of each leg, she gathers in the thread. It won't go to waste, as she'll eat it later. When it's all wound in, she sprays again. 
Out swings another 25 metre bridging line. Help a spider, no bigger than a thumbnail, can produce so much silk so quickly as baffled scientists. And it's no ordinary silk. It's the toughest natural fibre on the planet, tougher than steel. And it needs to be tough to span the White River. With the bridge torn to the ground anchor in place, it's time to construct a trap. These spiders can build the world's largest orb webs, up to two meters wide. A few miles from the first spray of bridging line, the job is done. So yeah, another fascinating video there. And again, the presenter talked about how something as small as a thumbnail can produce so much web um, after losing it all and then having to eat it all again, baffles scientists. And, and as, as people who believe creation, we love to hear, <laughs> hear that saying, when it baffles scientists, they just can't understand how anything so small could produce so much. Yeah, even after it's broken, she's got to take it all back in again and, and then bring it all out in 25 meters long. That's a huge span and again it uses the wind and it strengthens it and then obviously it creates the web to be able to catch um, all of its food in. Um, incredible and again it, it was the strongest material known to man. You know, I think of all the, the labs around the world and the scientists trying to create the strongest armor or, or you know whatever for their armies and, and here we've got a, a simple thing. It's small as a thumbnail is able to create the strongest substance known to man and again if, if this had evolved over um, millions of years, surely all spiders would be able to do this. Surely all spiders, it would be useful for them to be able to produce 25 meter long um, webs to go over rivers. Um, but again, an incredible, incredible video. Again, we read it, didn't we? The, the, the spider's web, that is what it's well known for. And it even baffles scientists today. So we're, we're coming towards the end of the talk. and. Like I said, there was over 900,000 different species um, and, and types of insects. And, and just before we close, I, I just wanted to just put some pictures up of some, again, just how different they are, how colorful, how incredible these different insects that have been created um, that can really help us think that there was an incredible designer um, involved in making them. The colors, the shapes, um, and what they're able to do and we, and we think of the of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly and the incredible um, thing that goes into that when, in, when it's becoming a, a chrysalis and, and his head goes from the top to the bottom and then it becomes a, a, a butterfly. But all of these incredible insects, so different, so varied, and also beautiful in the way that they are colored I'll just put this one up because this, this is a fairly new insect that has been discovered over the last 10 years or so. Um, and it, it's been very, it's, people have known about it, but nobody's been able to get a, a picture because they move so quickly and they're so small and, and they jump around very quickly. Um, now this, so the back of it has a likening to a 90s toy. Does anyone, does anyone have an idea what 90s toy that might be? Trolls. Trolls. And so this is called uh, the troll haired bug, because it has um, looks like uh, what is it? A troll haired <laughs> mystery bug found in Suriname, um, and that's just one example of these. Again, so varied, so incredible. These things that have been found by scientists, and it just reinforces Chris Darwin's belief that the world was created, that insects and animals were created by our heavenly Father. 
So now we're going to think about what animals are like now. So animals at the moment are driven by instinct, aren't they? We have many animals um, that kill to get their, their food. And we know that animal, there are some animals that kill humans when they're in, in the wrong situation at the wrong time. But there will be a time in the future when it will be different. So please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11, please. Because we, we had a, a wonderful um, afternoon looking at these incredible things that we read of in the Bible. All these things that have been created and, and what the Lord God of heaven has, has done for us and created. If we have all that to be able to believe in creation, there's so much more of the Bible that we should look at to understand and, and know. And Isaiah 11 is all about the kingdom to come when we believe that Jesus Christ will return and set up God's kingdom for him. And that is when the instinct of animals will change. So verse 1, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, who with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So that's describing Jesus. Out of the stem of Jesse, a branch with wisdom and understanding and, and all the incredible things he'll be able to do. He'll be able to judge righteously. There'll be no... Um, whether the judge got it right or wrong, he will judge correctly and righteously. And in verse 6, it talks about the animals. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's what it was like back in creation. The way that God made animals is that they were vegetarians, that they ate of, of the plants and, and the fruit and the vegetables that were created. They weren't made initially to be meat eaters. Um, but after the, the sin of Adam and Eve, um, it was changed, and, and we as Christians look forward to a time when it will go back to when you could have something like this, a, a, a child leading a lion um, and, and a cow and, and a wolf all together with no want to destroy. So verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my, in all my holy mountain, because the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so if we believe in creation, there's so much more of the Bible that we should be looking at, and especially this time to come, when it shall be back to like it was in creation. So thank you very much for your concentration this evening.